to Neurophilia Podcast Season 2. If this is your first time listening to the podcast or you have been following this platform for a while now, we want to thank you for taking some time to join us. The Neurophilia Podcast is a conversational medical show focused on connecting neurology with other fields in medicine. With each episode, we hope you develop an appreciation for and perhaps even a love of neurology. On today's episode, we have the absolute pleasure and privilege of sitting down with Dr. Elizabeth Kuhn to discuss the subspecialty of movement disorders and autonomic neurology. Dr. Elizabeth Kuhn graduated medical school from the University of Iowa and then completed her neurology residency at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, followed by a fellowship training in movement disorders and then autonomic disorders. She is the program director for the Adult Neurology Residency Program and the Autonomic Disorders Fellowship at Mayo Clinic. In addition to education, she co-founded Mayo Clinic's Multiple Systems Atrophy Clinic and is active in research on synucleinopathies and the history of medicine. Dr. Elizabeth Kuhn, welcome to the Neurophilia Podcast. Thank you for being our first guest speaker on season two. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. We are just so excited and thrilled to have you with us, and we couldn't imagine starting the season with a better guest. Um, and, you know, in the, in the brief introduction, we sort of highlighted your impressive background, but I really wanted to focus more on discussing your journey to neurology and review your career thus far. And so could we start by you telling us a little bit about where your journey to medicine and neurology initially began? Yeah, so I have wanted to be a neurologist since I was in eighth grade, and I was a teenager uh, and was really active and a runner and started having headaches and starting to miss a lot of school and then started to get nauseous, especially in the morning after waking up. And, and finally, one of my family medicine doctor, after treating for migraines and headaches and stress and all that, did, a, did an MRI when a... Um, semi-truck trailer that had an MRI on back rolled into my small town. And I remember going through that MRI on a Friday night and getting the call from the radiologist to my parents um, that night saying that I had a, a, a mass or pressure on my brain. And and so everything moved really quickly then. And we I ended up having a couple of surgeries as a teenager. And it was from then after I recovered, I said, wow, this brain is an incredible thing. And so I wanted to be a neurosurgeon for about a month. And then I realized, but surgeons don't get to talk to patients as much and have that long-term relationships with patients. And I really wanted that. So it was ever since being a teenager that I wanted to be a neurologist. Liz, did you get, um, I also, from a very early age, wanted to be a neurologist, uh, as some people have heard. And um, I felt like I was always envious of those people who just could like change their mind every every second, every day if they wanted to about what they wanted to be. And, you know, I, it was always this running joke with all my friends and my family that like, oh, Blake's in fourth grade and wants to be a neurologist. So did, did you get hassled over that growing up that, and knowing exactly what you wanted to do um, from an early age? And did you feel that you put a lot of pressure on yourself to try to get to that point, um, being so young and, and having a very clear path already laid out for you. That's a great, a great perspective on it. I don't feel like I don't feel like I got hassled so much, but I felt like in those teenage years when there's so much going on, I just had this laser focus of where I wanted to be. Uh, but I also know that if I would have kept more of an open mind and maybe looked at other fields uh, or even other specialties in neurology, that probably would have been a good thing too. But it was really laser focus on neurology from those, those teenage years. That said, I tell my residents to keep an open mind, to really explore everything with curiosity, because then I think you envision yourself in all these fantastic subspecialties in neurology. Do as I say, not as I do type uh, advice that we probably both give. <laughs> exactly. Dr. Kuhn, I mean, that is such an impressive story and sort of to have that own personal experience and have that sort of 
direct your career from such a young age is just such an amazing perspective to have. And it's so important on this podcast to be able to hear that. And so I'm curious, after you sort of had this personal experience and you went through undergrad education and then to medical school, did you ever deviate from wanting to be a neurologist? Were you ever tempted by a different subspecialty? I know you mentioned neurosurgery, but was there anything else that caught your eye during medical training? I think it was always, I was in love with the brain from that time on and, and neurons. And I had done some research in neural crest cells. So it was thinking ENT a little bit, but it was always because of that neurologic or that nervous system background. Uh, I can say there were things that I loved in medical school too, uh, including cardiology. And I think that fits with my interest in autonomics because now as an autonomic neurologist, I'm dealing with the brain's control on the heart. So it's it's all different ways of looking at these systems that we become so passionate about. Liz, you might have just, uh, for the first time ever, made me have uh, a, more of a feeling as a stroke neurologist, as a direct connection to an autonomic specialist. Um, we both share the heart in common quite a bit for what we do probably day in and day out. So I never really thought of uh, I thought of it like that, but it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And so when you were doing your medical school training at the University of Iowa, how much neurology was established at your institution? Did you have a core clerkship? How did you sort of get that experience and exposure to know that was what you wanted to pursue long-term? Yeah, and, and that's where I was really lucky to be at Iowa because we had some fantastic neurologists. So we had three weeks core, a core clerkship, but also a really strong neuroanatomy in our preclinical years. And that really cemented it that I just love this field. I tutored it every chance I could get. And then the clinical years cemented that. We had fantastic and still have fantastic stroke neurologists uh, at Iowa. So getting to be part of their teaching rounds and it was, was really fantastic and cemented my love for neurology. That's amazing. And so when you were graduating from medical school, about to start neurology residency, what did you imagine your career was going to look like at that point? Yes. And this gets back even to when I was doing research on neural crest cells. I think I was still an undergraduate and doing this at the University of Iowa. And I had the opportunity to shadow uh, Hank Paulson, who was a movement disorder specialist. So I was you know, studying the genetics in these zebrafish and looking at their genetic codes and looking at all these repeat sequences. And then in the afternoons, I would go with Hank to their Huntington's disease clinic and really seeing that genetic clinical correlate. And it was with Hank that I just fell in love with movement disorders and seeing just how visual movement disorders is, but also how much you can do for the patient, even in Huntington's disease, just assembling these multidisciplinary teams to care for the patients and the families. Uh, it was just so amazing. And so even then I knew I wanted to do movement disorders and it comes down to mentorship and exposure. It was just so important for me at a young age. Beautifully said. So you graduated from the University of Iowa, and then you decided to go to Mayo Clinic to pursue your residency training. What stood out to you about the Mayo Clinic and what has kept you there over all these years? It's a great question. And it goes back to those original experiences that brought me into medicine is that the primary value of Mayo Clinic is the needs of the patient come first. And so that really spoke to me, having seen medicine first as a patient, but more so what it did to my family. So that seven o'clock Friday night phone call with the radiologist and how just destroyed my parents were in hearing that news. And so keeping the patient and the family at the center of the encounter was something I was really looking forward to and how the training really revolves around that philosophy. Uh, so that drew me here. And then ultimately how the system is arranged around the patients has, has helped keep me here. I love that. And it, it makes me think of a, another question I have for you. You know, since you have this personal and intimate connection to medicine, being a patient yourself, 
how have your experiences in the healthcare system sort of guided the way that you practice medicine and the way that you sort of provide education and training to your residents? I'm sure we'll talk more about your role as, you know, a clinician educator down the line, but I'm very curious to hear about how that's influenced your career thus far. Yeah, and that's a great question. And that's something that, you know, I always hope to to hold closely because it's it's so tough being a patient, not just the fact that you have this neurologic disease or have this uncertainty with different symptoms, but even the fact of getting an appointment, coming into the clinic, the parking situation, how your life was rearranged around just making to the appointment is so important so that I know that when I am sitting you know, across from a patient uh, and I have a full calendar for that one patient that's in front of me, that is the most important thing that I need to be thinking of and I need to be focusing on and to making sure I'm bringing my best to every patient every day is is something that I strive for. I'm sure I don't always make it, but I I really hope to be doing that for my patients. Just hearing those words, it's just such a reminder, you know, to what we do day in and day out. And I think sometimes when you hear it from somebody else or you hear it from a colleague, it just, it resonates a little bit more. And so I appreciated everything that you just said. And it, it even makes me kind of take a step back and just think through, you know, what we do and why we do what we do every day. So I really appreciated that a lot. Um, a lot of residents that I see, it's like in, in medical school, everybody says your first branch point is deciding, do you want to be a surgeon or do you want to be something medical related? And then I see in residency, a lot of residents kind of hit this branch point of, uh, do I want to be an inpatient heavy neurologist or do I want to be an outpatient? What is my vibe? What is my pace? Um, it sounds like you found that out pretty early on, but then even if we go past residency and it sounds pretty clear that movement was a path that you were going to be on, um, can you talk to us a little bit about your fellowship and then what made you start your path to being what, what some of us call forever fellows and, and deciding to do another fellowship after your first one? Yeah, absolutely. And so I had this love for movement disorders early on. And you know, I really enjoy being in the hospital. It's very intense uh, interactions with patients because they're often in, 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 in such acute situations. But I just love sitting down with my patients and hearing and having that luxury of time and hearing more about, you know, how they're doing and how you know different neurologic symptoms are affecting them. And more importantly, what we can do to try and improve that quality of life. And so I found that in movement disorders. And so my very first uh, elective as a PGY2 neurology was in movement disorders. And I got to movement disorders. Yes, th these are my people. This is this is what I love. But when we talk about mentorship and exposure, what I wasn't prepared for was that the movement disorder doc that I was working with that very first elective was, was Bob Feely. And Bob Feely was a movement and an autonomic person. And so he introduced me to autonomics at that time and how autonomics was so quintessential to so many of our patients with movement disorders and just how the examination was so complimentary. And that really opened my eyes to the world of, of autonomics and combining both movement and autonomics. See, Nubra, this is a problem because then I just, uh, I asked one question and so many more come to my mind whenever you start to talk about this, um, that I, as, as another neurologist, I get excited about things like this. So um, one of my questions um, I suppose is, um, for somebody looking into a movement disorders um, fellowship or an autonomics fellowship, can you just give all of our listeners kind of the uh, breakdown of how many years typically? I know that there are different approaches to doing both of these. So what does a typical path look like in the time commitment uh, through those fellowships? Absolutely. So, let, so talking about movement disorder, so uh, fellowships are generally one or two years. Um, if it's a two-year fellowship, either it's going to have extra research associated with it, or it's going to have more deep brain stimulation, DBS uh, involvement. And so here we have a movement that is separate from our deep brain stimulation. So it's a one-year uh, fellowship, but you can find one or two depending on your interests. Um, movement fellowship is generally in the outpatient setting, um, though if you have some deep brain stimulation, you're probably in the OR doing some of those implantations and then uh, a lot of clinic time. I'm also really lucky because we have a movement 
electrophysiology lab where we do a lot of our Botox injections for dystonias, blepharospasms, focal dystonias. Uh, and so I get quite a variety with movement disorders. Uh, you segued perfectly into one of my other questions, um, and that is, you know, in medical school and probably early residency, um, a, a lot of sometimes the, the joke uh, with movement disorders clinic is, you know, can we titrate cinemat or not? And, you know, do you want to go into a, a specialty, a subspecialty of neurology to where you're just titrating meds? And uh, I've realized, uh, obviously, throughout many years that uh, there's so much more to movement disorders, which it was one of my favorite electives also, just because I didn't know that so much existed. Um, and so what are some of the challenges that you face from just a movement disorders portion? And what are the, some of the things that you love taking care of that maybe some people wouldn't even think about when they think of movement disorders? Yeah, absolutely. And this brings me uh, brings up a conversation I recently had with one of our fellows. And so we have a unique fellowship where uh, it's the Australasian neurologist. So usually Aust Australia or New Zealand neurologists fully train and they come and do fellowship here. And we're speaking about what he wanted to do. He's like, you know, I really want to get better at movement disorders because they are the best clinicians. I'm going, yes. Uh, but I think it speaks to what we do as movement disorder neurologists is that um, we are able to categorize some of the most complex um, kind of phenomenology, if you will. So it, kind of categorizing how patients come in, either as a hyperkinetic disorder with excessive movement or hypokinetic with you know, reductions in movement or combinations. So that diagnostic uh, component, your physical examination, your history is so important in movement disorders and that, you know, how that examination piece really fits in. And what I love about movement disorders is that we are always watching. So I think of us as some of the most observant neurologists because we're picking up clues early in the history and how the patients are holding their hands or their blink rate or what they're doing at different times or how much movement they have in addition to kind of what we see on examination. When I see you at AAM next year, I'm going to have to be mindful of like, what, <laughs> what, am, I, what am I doing? Am I, uh, I'll, I'll have to keep that in mind. But yeah, um, I think a lot of neurology, uh, all of us, especially as neurologists, I think we all consider ourselves pretty observant people. So you brought up a really good point that you're probably at the pinnacle of, of observing. So I never thought of it like that before. Um, and then if we transition into your autonomic role, um, I, I suppose, do you interact with other subspecialties of neurology? Do you, uh, obviously, cardiology, do you interact with other medicine specialties? I'd be curious to know, I would imagine that you have quite a lot of interaction with colleagues in that space. And so it gets to what we think of as autonomics. So I think about autonomics as the physiology of neurology. So, you know, the brain, our nerves control everything we do, including the things that we don't automatically think about, or some of those that autonomic auto, uh, type features. And so I think about, you know, physiology with autonomics, and there's so much overlap between so many different subspecialties. So cardiology is certainly one, but endocrinology, sleep, um, pulmonology, rheumatology. It, it, it's really fascinating how much connection autonomics has. But what I also love about autonomics is that it has so much um, overlap between the different subspecialties, even in neurology. So we know even MS, multiple sclerosis, has significant can have significant autonomic involvement. Patients with stroke, right? If it hits that right insula, we know there's risk for uh, arrhythmias and increased troponin uh, elevation. So I think almost every subspecialty, even in neurology, has some autonomic overlay, which is so fun. And movement is, is, is definitely closely linked with that, too. The passion is just oozing out of uh, the, the video, which uh, always makes us so excited. And um, I, I absolutely love hearing, uh, and, and it makes me kind of re-excited about movement disorders and autonomics. Um, I, I had just had two follow-up questions, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Nooper, but one of them is, uh, for those people who are considering going into movement disorders or want to know more about the subspecialty of movement or autonomics, um, if you had to, 
uh, give them the, the cons or here's something about my day to day or here's something about the field that I wish would change. Um, what do you see uh, could be barriers or, or what is something that you would identify as an area that the, the fields could improve upon? That's a great question. I think that with movement disorders, I almost always wish I had more time with my patients. So some of these visits can can take a lot of time and be, be complex. I don't think that's necessarily unique to movement disorders, but but something that um, if you have a tough day or you're running late can, can be frustrating. Um, I think I've always wished that the field would move faster, you know, that we have a cure for Parkinson's disease, that we can, you know, you know, really have a cure for these genetic disorders like Huntington's disease. That said, I'm still very optimistic in just the incredible uh, advances that we see both on diagnostics and biomarkers and disease modifying uh, treatment. So I am very optimistic that in my career, we will have so much to offer our patients. Yeah, all excellent points. Um, and then the last one specifically to potentially movement and maybe some overlap with autonomic is um, over the last several years, uh, as you're aware, there has been a, a, a big change in how we approach functional neurological disorders. And um, I see this in a lot of subspecialties in neurology, but I, I feel at least here, uh, the bulk of these patients are often cared for by our movement disorder specialists. And so um, with the changes in the DSM-5 and just more um, kind of care and attention to these people and neurologists really taking ownership um, of some of these disorders, do you is this something that you see frequently in your clinics? Um, and what is your approach and your thought about the field of functional neurological disorders moving forward? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think uh, I'm glad you brought that up because functional neurologic disorders it has kind of so much effect on our patients and this the the symptom burden and how much you know they are not able able to do. Yet, because of some of these treatments, um, they can also be some of the most gratifying patients to treat. So, we have a physical medicine and rehabilitation run program here. We call it the BEST program. And if a patient's diagnosed with functional movement disorders, then they can go through this five day program. And we see them back at the end of those five days. And those are the absolute best visits because we can see the gains and the hope and the patients excited to reclaim so many different areas of their life uh, that is just so rewarding. So I, like I said, there's been a lot of advances in better diagnostics, but also knowing what we can do to help these patients. Yeah, and to your point, back to the start, I, I think time is, is really needed with a lot of these patients. And I, I have several patients that come in with stroke symptoms and you know they're diagnosed with functional neurologic disorder. And, I always follow these patients back because I feel like continuity uh, really helps with these patients and, and time. So um, I'm glad that you all have a, a very specific program set out to, to helping with them. So thanks for chatting about that a little bit. Absolutely. All right, Nooper, I'm done for now. I'm just in awe, like sitting here and listening to the both of you talk. And Dr. Kuhn, the amount of just passion and love you have for movement disorders and autonomic, it is so palpable through the screen. And I, I'm sure anyone listening to this episode is just gonna be as enthralled by the topic of movement disorders as you are just by the way that you present it. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious because I know when we talk about neurology, especially when it comes to residency training, it is, it is very inpatient dominated. Um, and I know recently since with ERAS and the need to apply for fellowship coming up sooner and sooner and people needing to make that decision even earlier in their residency training. I'm curious, um, I know that you mentioned that mentorship and exposure are sort of like the main things it takes to really know what you wanna do and find your path. But when you were going through residency training and now as a residency program director, what do you recommend for young neurology residents who might be open or haven't had that exposure to outpatient neurology, what should they do in the neurology training to get that exposure? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it, it's such a, a, a paradox, right? I think that in our, our like our in our PGY2, we spend a lot of time in the hospital and that's where you see so many patients and you get really good at your exam and acute treatment of neurology, yet you could be missing a subspecialty that you could fall in love with. 
I think that the best thing a resident can do is just keep an open mind on any of these um, subspecialties. And then also it kind of, I guess it goes to your barometer on what you're excited about. So say you've got, I just came off gen general neurology service and we had patients with so many different, we had seizures, we had strokes, we had peripheral nervous system disorders. And, and, and so having the residents really listen to themselves as to what they were drawn to, you know, which patients they enjoyed following following most during that time can really help set you up for success when you do have more of that outpatient time to prioritize, uh, you know, evaluating the different subspecialties. And even in continuity clinics, you know, seeing what uh, are these these patients, which I'm even more excited to see back than 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 not. Yeah, I think that that is such a good way to sort of maximize those those rotations where you're not inpatient and sort of find what you gravitate to and and find people that are doing the things that you are passionate about because it seems like that was really instrumental to sort of you finding this perfect intersection between movement disorders and autonomic neurology was that early mentorship that you received in residency training. Um, and so to sort of shift gears a little bit, because we've been talking a lot in this conversation about your clinical interests in movement disorders. And I'm I'm curious about your academic interests in terms of medical education. Where did that come about? And sort of how did you end up in the current leadership role that you hold at the Mayo Clinic? Yeah, that's great. And I, I think that education has always been so important. Uh, and and even looking back to my younger years, and I think back, you know, my grandparents were educators and learning from them and seeing what an impact they had on people's life, people who would come back to them decades later and say, oh, I had you in this history class or you were my coach. And, and, and that really was important to see that that impact on education. And so education has always been something that has interested in me and, and then what I love so much now as a program director, and Blake can probably support this too, is just seeing residents, you know, you know, learn these neurologic skills, become the best neurologist that they can be, and have that passion, take that passion into caring for patients is probably one of the absolute most gratifying things that that we can have. So I used to think that the most important thing I could do was take care of patients. I still believe that. That is number one, take care of the patients in front of us. Then I thought, well, research is so important. I want to advance the field. And I still believe that too. But what I really strongly feel is that the most good can be helping these young neurologists, you know, be the best neurologists they can be and then go out uh, into the world. That is the most gratifying. Liz, my favorite part of all of that is I'm just thinking if if you ask neurologists, is a stroke neurologist and a movement disorders neurologist, are they similar people? Most people would say absolutely not. <laughs> There's no way. Um, but then if we come back to neurologists and our mission and our love of teaching, I think all neurologists, whether they're slated into a clinical educator role or not, I think a lot of us love to teach. And so everything you just said, I was just in my mind saying, ditto, ditto, ditto. And so um, this this season on the podcast, I think it's going to be so special because we're all neurologists. And even though we subspecialize in a lot of different ways, and those subspecialties are very different from one another, um, so many things that you said just resonate with me. And I just say we're cut from the same cloth. And so um, it's just... It's nice to have that reminder that we as neurologists really, really have a shared sense of what we're doing and a shared love for what we're doing. Absolutely. So this is a question, I guess, for the both of you, since you both share the role of being program directors, Dr. Kuhn at the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Galeco being at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, you know, obviously you've both touched on sort of the best parts of being a clinician educator and being involved with residency leadership. What are the challenges that that role presents in your overall day-to-day -day work? I'll let Blake go first. I'm just joking. Um, I was going to say, this is this is your spotlight podcast, not, not mine. 
I think that, you know, there's so many rewards and challenges, but and I think the hardest part, and I'm a new program director, I just finished my first year, um, it, it's a 24-7 job. So I'm a mother, and I'm always worrying about my kids and thinking about where they are. Okay, this one is, you know, now going, and, and so that's always going on in my head. And then I, I now have this sense of, all of these residents is, are they okay? You know, how's this rotation going? It's, you know, is the emergency department treating them well? And, and so I, it's it's not so much worry, it's just uh, just making sure they're all doing well is is, is a f feeling that I, I, you know, is hard to anticipate. And not that I see myself as their mother in any way, because these are fully grown adults doing incredible things, taking care of patients, but, it's that sort of sense of uh, just making sure they're doing all right. That uh, it, it, I don't know if that ever goes away. Does that ever go away, Blake? So I, I suppose you're asking the wrong person because uh, I, I'm I'm right there with you. You know, I just finished my first year um, here as well, and so I think that we're at a very uh, similar point in what we're doing from this standpoint. And everything that you said, I completely agree with. Um, it, it's this sense of almost like I care for patients and I want to check in. I want to know, how are you doing? How are you doing? I, it's the same thing. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that there's this sense of, um, I care more about their well-being than my well-being oftentimes. Um, and you just want to make sure that you're as responsive as, as you possibly can be, that as programs grow and we both have big programs, that you really try to take the time to get to know everybody on, on a very personal basis you know, kind of basis. And I would say that one thing that uh, to your 24 seven job standpoint, the administrative portion of keeping track of a large residency and everything from GME and AC GME that you have to do um, was a little bit uh, harrowing to say the least for this first year um, and getting used to all the requirements and all the things that go on behind the scenes, you know, Marianne before me, Marianne Mays did this for 17 years. And I'm like, I, you know, you don't hear about that very often. And I, I just, um, a lot of uh, appreciation for anyone in medical education and the behind the scenes work that I, I don't think a lot of people see. Um, now we're both experiencing it firsthand. And um, even that by itself is a full-time job doing all the paperwork necessary and making sure that you're keeping track of any everybody from that standpoint, I think is really important. So those are some of the things that I've noticed within this first year that sound similar to what you have. Yeah, the administrative part is 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 huge, and and it's um, I don't want to say it's not appreciated because everyone appreciates that your program stays accredited, right? But the sheer number of hours that go into it, and you know, I used to do a lot more research. I think, oh, I could have written a pretty nice manuscript or done a really good, nice data analysis in this amount of time. Um, and yeah, it, it does, it does take, take a lot of time. Nuber, what I will say though, is um, what I find and and how I know that even though my life looks a lot different over the last year that it has before in the past, is that um, there's work that you do that will drain you. And there's work that you will do that will energize you. And whenever I'm doing things related to education or the residency, even though I have long days and long nights, I feel energized doing it. And I feel like there is a sense of purpose that's bigger than something that I felt before in the past. And so that's at least a reminder to me that you're going to have long days, but you feel good about it. Um, that's where you should be. So if you have long days and you just have to grind through it and it makes you really feel drained, then maybe that's not your academic niche or that's not your subspecialty. But if you have long days, which you will, and you just have the sense of either calm or peace or gratification, that's probably uh, where you should be. I love that, Blake. And I will say that um, my kid's preschool teacher, uh, Grandma Sherry, she calls that bucket filling. She says, everything will try and drain your bucket, but what fills your bucket and be a bucket filler too. So I love that. I absolutely love be a bucket filler. I, Dr. Kuhn, you are so impressive and you do so many things. You, you're a, a clinician, you're a clinician educator, you do research on the side. And as you alluded to, I believe you're a mother of four. Correct me if I'm mistaken. How, I'm a lot of, yeah. 
how do you manage it all? Yeah, I think some days are better than others. <laughs> um, I I can't say how lucky I am to have my family, though. I mean, we, like a lot of women in medicine, had fertility issues. And so now if someone would have told me that and you would have four kids by the end of it, I would I would have just not even believed them. And so I, part of that, though, has just made me appreciate them so much. And, um, you know, my partner works full time, too. So we just have a lot of communication to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks, but things certainly do at times. Um, I took some advice from uh, uh, our, the program director in uh, internal medicine. And I'm, uh, so she used to say, Amy Oxenteco said that you're always juggling. And so there are glass balls and you just can never drop the glass balls. So I think, what are my glass balls? My glass balls are my family. So I know that I always need to make sure that they are okay. They feel cared for. Yes, I will have some long days here and there, but it's always to hold those tightly and just so grateful for everything that I, I get to balance. I love that. I love that so much. Dr. Valeka, what are your glass balls? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that uh, while she was saying this. I was like, what a what a perfect, perfect comparison. And, um, you know, family, definitely for me, you know, I, I think that I'm at a point in my life that's different than a lot of my colleagues where I don't have children. Um, I've been planning a, a wedding for the last year as I've taken over this PD role. So my life has been uh, nice and hectic. Um, but definitely family and the people around me, you know, I, I uh, grew up in this area. And so um, I would say that my juggling, uh, my free ball glass uh, is sometimes split between a lot of different people because I have so many friends and family that are all still within this area. And so my time is just split in so many different ways that, um, to be honest with you, um, I, I would say that juggling the me glass ball um, is important. And I've learn that it's important because I can't do all these other things that I try to do day in and day out if I'm not taking care of myself. Um, and so I do think it's really important while everybody is juggling something um, to figure out which one of those are the important ones, uh, as Liz has pointed out, but also not to forget that you should put yourself in one of those glass balls, maybe, if I could steal your, uh, your juggling analogy and um, making sure that you're doing the things that you love to do that will uh, I'll throw it out there again, fill your own bucket um, and, and really make sure that you're taking care of yourself. I think that it's something that we as physicians often ignore. Uh, we're, we're very busy taking care of other people that I think spending some time on some self-care and, and focusing on yourself, I think uh, is probably not done enough in our community and something that you should definitely uh, think about if you don't feel fulfilled. That's fantastic. Keep yourself as one of those glass balls. I love that. I'm just taking your perfect framework for all these things and just adding one thing to it. So thanks for letting me work off of what, what you brought to us. So even though we're not in the first season of Neurophilia, I, I want to ask you, um, uh, because during this conversation, it seems like you have known exactly what you wanted to do and who you wanted to be since you were in eighth grade. And I'm sure along the way, there are moments of doubt and uncertainty, but I'm wondering because, you know, the purpose of this podcast, the reason it was originally created was to help combat neurophobia or the fear of clinical neurology. And I wanna ask you, Dr. Kuhn, have you experienced neurophobia? Do you experience it currently? And what is your advice to medical students or young resident doctors who might be currently experiencing it? Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And so that's like now, you know, and thinking about this podcast, reflecting back on my path, you know, it seems very linear. And yes, I have wanted to be a neurologist from eighth grade, but it's very much a winding path, you know, in terms of uh, just where you go to, to medical school, where you do residency and, and, you know, autonomics kind of coming in last minute, finding my, my love for that and changing and, 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 so, and also, I want to point out that from when I graduated residency, I've always wanted to be an educator and thought, oh, the dream job would be a program director. But I thought that it was going to 
I didn't think I could do it, to be honest. Um, I I didn't think that for various reasons that I had what it takes to be a program director. So I started building up more of my clinical research. But as I did that and was going down that pathway, you know, it was closing off those education doors. And I realized, no, this isn't okay. I love this education part. Let's go back on that pathway. And so it, it wasn't as linear of a pathway. And I'll also say too, I, I don't know what made me think that I couldn't do it, that I wasn't good enough to be a program director, but you know, I'm the first woman program director at Mayo Clinic. And when I was training here, there even hadn't been a woman as department chair. So I don't know if subconsciously, I just didn't see someone. Um, and there were fantastic program directors before me. Uh, so it, it really took like Lyle Jones, who was a program director uh, who I uh, followed as an incredible ally and kind of talking me up that, oh, yes, you are our curriculum chair. You are the course director for this. You know, why don't you consider yourself as that program director? And other people recognizing that, like, well, why not would I want to do this absolute dream job? So there's going to be doubts among those different decision points. And that's okay too. And it's also okay to have rambling pathways uh, if you just keep following those passions. I mean, that that was just so beautiful. And I, you were doing a phenomenal job as, as program director. Um, and I can't wait to see what you do in the future. And I think that's, that's so special to hear because um, I know some of the research and some of the work that you've done is specifically in the realm of women in neurology and women in leadership. And so um, would you consider that to be an important part of sort of your academic profile and what you consider important um, in your career? Yeah, I think so. I think my interest, I have an interest in history of neurology. And this is where Chris, Chris Bates, my program director, it had done a, a bunch in history of neurology and it was, I, I liked it. It was good. And then we talk about allies, you know, Chris Bass and Stephen Rich at university of Maryland gave me an opportunity to do a talk on uh, Denise Louis Barr, uh, an, an early woman neurologist. And I got so excited about that. It really opened up this um, field on early women in neurology and understanding their path. It gives me so much gratitude for how much they pave the way for us and what we can do today because of what they are, are kind of for uh, mother neurologists did for us. Uh, and so that really opened up a lot of doors. And then also thinking about how we view uh, in research, you know, sex and gender issues. What else can we do to, to look into these different topics? This has always been fascinating. What do you hope changes in hmm. the field of neurology going forward? What do I hope changes? You know, in terms of training, what I what I worry about is, you know, neurology residency can be very tough, right? It's long hours, could be that bucket training. I worry about our residents entering the workforce already burned out or depleted. And so what I hope that I, what I hope you know changes over time is more of that bucket filling. That residency fills your bucket, and then you're entering it, your practice, you know, as resilient as possible, so that you can be the best clinician, educator, researcher that you possibly could be. And I just worry a bit about the high levels of burnout in our field and neurology in general, and in residency. And so that's something that I certainly hope will change. Definitely. And I, I think a lot of what this conversation has been is sort of thinking about the ways to fill your bucket and being intuitive and introspective and finding the things that resonate with you and sticking to those and holding on to those. So thank you so much for your perspective, Dr. Kuhn, and taking time today to talk with us about your journey, to talk about your academic interests, the subspecialty of movement disorders. Um, it has just been such a pleasure to just sit down and talk with you today. 
Thank you. And I also know that the future is so bright you know, with future neurologists uh, like yourself. I'm just so excited to see what the future will bring. Yeah, Liz, I think um, to your point too about burnout, it's so great that we're having these conversations about it. And it's great that this is emphasized and it's being talked about and it's being looked at. So I think that's the first step is recognizing that there's a problem and then uh, people like you coming up with a lot of innovative solutions to, to being able to combat this and what can we do as a community to help our residents. So um, I'm excited uh, you know, to get to work with you uh, throughout our journey on the same, same page in the next several years um, to be able to bounce ideas off of each other. And so I, I've just really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit better and having your kind of take on just life and neurology and movement and autonomics. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, I know that Nuper likes to do some no-brainers to end with, but I figured that maybe um, we could give you like a, a one last open pitch uh, because this is very, uh, the hope is that we draw some attention to movement, to autonomics. So if you were giving us like your one minute pitch for anybody who's on the fence or anybody who just says, make me go into movement, I think you've already done that to some degree throughout this podcast, but what's your final uh, one minute pitch to us about movement and autonomics? Oh, I think movement is the best for uh, observation, for understanding phenomenology and getting to have long-term relationships with patients. And then autonomics is so rich in understanding the physiology and connecting uh, neurology and physiology um, to so many different areas of neurology. Well, I know that I have a, a slightly increased uh, newfound, oh, I, I should go and brush up on some of my movement knowledge and autonomics. Uh, and so I, I think I even feel charged by this conversation. So um, thank you so much for everything. And I'll let Nuper now fire away her no-brainers for you. Yeah, Dr. Kuhn, the next time I'm in Minnesota, I want to go to a park with you and just watch you watch people. I think that would be a great opportunity. Very educational. Yeah. Liz, is it ever bothersome to you? Like, do you ever, are you ever just like, I need to, st I need to stop? <laughs> you know, that's interesting because if I'm out in the public, sometimes I've got, I'm always counting one, two, three, four, making, you know, so that's my observation focus is a little bit, a little bit different, making sure, you know, kids not knocking something over in the grocery store. But Newper, no, I, what I would love is going to, like a concert like Taylor Swift Beyonce just came into town I mean that would be the fan most fantastic people watching I would say we'll make a plan for it so before we conclude any episode of neurophilia we always like to ask our amazing guests about their no-brainers and these are going to be five rapid fire questions that you can respond to with one word or one sentence maximum are you ready to go Dr. <laughs> Ready, let's bring it. All right. What was your favorite part of this conversation? Nuber and Blake. Love it. How do you avoid burnout in medicine? Running. Physical activity. Physical activity. Last movie you watched. Ooh, it would definitely be an animated movie. Does Bluey count? Um, I think it was Everest or Avalanche with my kids. Was it good? It's a pretty good movie. Okay. Best ice cream flavor? Chocolate. Love it. And the last question we have, what are you most proud of? Mm. I'm most proud of, you know, personally, my children uh, and, and my husband, and then professionally, all my, all the residents. I'm so proud of everything they do. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kuhn. I have a one minute conclusion if I can quickly do it and then we'll be done recording. Okay. Sounds good. In this episode, we discuss the subspecialty of movement disorders and autonomic neurology, the importance of mentorship and exposure in medical training, and sharing a love for medical education and clinical practice. Thank you once again to our phenomenal guest, Dr. Elizabeth Kuhn, for joining us on this episode, and thank you for listening to the episode. 
If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review, share it with a friend, and follow us at Neurophilia Pod for updates on future episodes. See you next time.